Okay, folks, welcome to today's uh, webinar, GDPR Principles, Data Protection Information Security. This is our third webinar of the year. Um, and I'd like to say we have uh, a full house, more or less, uh, for today's session. The format, uh, well, uh, let me go on to our next slide, um, just to set the scene. Okay, GDPR, is it an opportunity or a threat? Uh, we'll let you guys decide at the end of this uh, webinar. But just some small stats. Uh, according to the Federation of Small Businesses in a survey that they had this year, February 2018, only 8% of small firms polled said that their GDPR preparations were complete. We would like to do a quick poll among your good selves just to find out where you feel you are in your GDPR journey. Um, so uh, the poll is now open. If you would mind giving us your feedback and then we can share that before we move on. Okay, uh, so far we've 49% of you have said yes, and uh, the remainder saying no stroke somewhat. So I think it's safe to say uh, our audience, uh, maybe 50%, half are thinking, yes, we, we have a good idea of what we need to do. And the other half are saying, well, hopefully today will give us some guidance and help. So what are we gonna cover today? So. What we'd like to cover, um, we're gonna go over what is GDPR, uh, just for some of you that maybe this is your, just catching up on what everyone's now talking about. The key GDPR principles, and basically this is a, a further extension which Mark's gonna cover on the Data Protection Act. Mark will then finish in terms of saying, look, this is the, the risks that you need to be aware of in regards to data that you hold. Uh, experience will then pick up on the opportunity or the threat of GDPR, but we'd also like to share with you some of the key areas that data loss, whether it be accidental or foul, can leak from an organization. And ideally, before we finish for questions, is look at IT steps towards you achieving GDPR compliance. Now, this webinar is no means a way of saying this will make you compliant. It's gonna be up to all of you individual organizations to use this really as a stepping stone to really review your own systems, the data that you hold, how that data is held. And we're using this webinar purely as an educational session. There will be an opportunity for you to issue questions at the end. Um, so, uh, and we'll hopefully be able to address those questions, whether they be for Mark's side or from a technology perspective. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand you now over to Mark, who's going to take us through what is GDPR. Mark. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, my name is Mark. I've just been introduced. Um, I'm an information security and data protection consultant with Quadra. So I'm going to take you through some of the basics around uh, around GDPR. Okay. First off, GDPR. Um, it stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, it's a new piece of legislation that has come in um, from the EU. Uh, as it's a regulation, it, it is effectively um, law. Um, the, the current Data Protection Act um, was a directive, and then that's why we have our own Data Protection Act um, around that. Um, it is described as the most important change in data protection in 20 years. Um, the current Data Protection Act is now, is, uh, now 20 years old, uh, and if you can imagine um, the, the, the change in the technology landscape in the last 20 years. And what this legislation is designed to do is to bring data protection really into the 21st century. Um, if you imagine since 1998, um, we all, well, we're all on this webinar, for example. Um, that just wouldn't have happened um, back in 1998 unless you were working for a big mega rich corporation. 
Um, we all have computers, tablets, smartphones. We're all signed up to online services, um, you know, like like this web session, for, for example. Uh, most people are going to have some sort of relationship with Apple, Google, uh, Facebook have obviously been in the in the media quite negatively. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn, all, all that sort of stuff. So the, the the legislation that was sitting there was was basically deemed to be not no longer fit for purpose. So GDPR is designed to bring it um, up to spec, uh, and the idea of the of of the legislation is really to protect us as individuals and what organisations are are doing with our data. Um, because we also work for organisations, we are we are interested in how how the legislation is going to impact those le our organisations and how we uh, um, how we handle data and how we show ourselves to be compliant with with this with this legislation. So it's there to protect us as individuals, but as organisation, it gives us um, a few things that we need to do to make sure that we're we're compliant. So as I mentioned, um, it was brought in to um, uh, bring data protection up, up to scratch. Uh, and also is to harmonise data protection laws across the 27 EU member states. Um, because the previous data protection was a, a directive, each country has effectively gone off and done its own interpretation of what that directive said. So because this is a regulation, this has got this has effectively gone um, straight in. Um, so all the organise all the com or organisations, all the countries within within the EU um, are all working off the same uh, the same legislation. Um, and I know some people have thought about, well, with Brexit, it doesn't really apply to us. Um, well, it does. It's actually technically part of our, our legislation now and has been since 2016. Um, but we've had two years really to, to get uh, to get up to speed with it. And it's being enforced um, from, from May this year. Um, so, yeah, so the new legislation is going to apply to all businesses. And to be honest, even, even within... Um, with the with Brexit, um, with the UK uh, effectively leaving um, next year, I believe. Um, if you think about it, if you employ um, any people who are still EU subjects, this is still going to apply. If you want to do business with any kind of EU companies, um, the legislation is going to apply. You're going to have to comply with this um, to, in order to, to do business. And then obviously, because in Northern Ireland, we never do easy. Um, if you have any employees that currently hold dual nationality or have an Irish passport, well, they're EU citizens, so this is still going to apply. Um, and again, there are clear rules about data transfer across borders. There's a number of countries that are seen to be safe to, to, do, to do business with. Okay, so the next slide is really some of the, um, the actual principles around GDPR. These are broadly similar to actually what's in the Data Protection Act. They have just been tweaked um, for, this, uh, for this new version of the legislation. So I've taken this from the ICO guidelines. I like to say I wrote it, but I didn't. I stole it. So the first one is the most important part of this. It's data to do with um, personal data, to do, which is to do with individuals, is processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner in relation to individuals. So those are the key important parts about the legislation. For every piece of personal data that you hold in your organization, you need to have identified the lawful basis for, for holding and processing that information. Um, you need to let people know what you're doing with that data uh, and where you're transferring it to. So that's the fairly and, and the transparency. So if you keep thinking about we have to be transparent with what we're doing with this data, you're going a long way to meeting the requirements of, of, the, of the legislation. So to follow on from the transparency part, um, the data that you collect has to be for a specified, explicit and legitimate purpose and not further process in a manner that is incompatible with, with those purposes. Um, and that's where Facebook have gotten into, uh, uh, in, into, uh, into trouble because they were letting some of their third party organizations, Cambridge Analytica, that, that effectively were, were going off and doing stuff with the data that people weren't aware of. And that's where they're going to fall foul of this um, fair and, and, and uh, lawful and transparency clauses. Uh, the next point is the data that you gather needs to be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary. Um, so it's the limitation clause that's quite important there. What you have to really do is prove that you're only gathering the information that you require to perform a function. Um, uh, and for that data to have a, a lawful basis for holding and processing that information. So for example, in your HR records, there's all sorts of stuff that you would gather in there. But for example, if you were a normal office based business and for example, you wanted to collect somebody's, for example, blood group, you would find it very, very difficult to justify holding that information. Um, unless somebody had a very specific medical condition. Um, so that would be an example of, of going sort of over the top um, with, with, with gathering information. So you need to have a look at your data and make sure that what you have is, is limited to what you need. 
Um, the next section is really around the data is accurate and kept up to date. Um, so you hear about some of the data subject rights. So this is really around the, this idea of, of, of uh, information and um, the right to, to correction. Um, so it really, what that's really saying is somebody contact, contacts you and say, okay, this data is not right. Um, you need to take quick steps really just to make sure that the, the data is, um, is corrected. So that's, that's a fairly straightforward um, part, part, of the, uh, part of the principles. Okay, uh, okay. The next one is um, the idea of um, the data, you only hold it for as long as is necessary for that particular um, operation. Uh, and that's where we get into having policies and processes around data retention. Now, there, obviously there's a number of things that you will have in your organization where you are required to hold information for um, a set minimum period of time uh, as required by law. So a classic example would be your HR records, um, your financial records where you have to hold for, I think it's, it can be interpreted as six or seven years. Um, current year plus six, I think is, is, is the way it is. Pension records have to be held for, well, I'm not going to quite say forever, but certainly a very, very long period of time. So this is where you need to set your retention periods and you need to think about at the end of our retention periods, do we have the processes in place to actually either delete the records um, or to anonymize the records where you can keep a certain amount of information for statistical um, uh, analysis. There is a sub clause in there that you are allowed to keep specific data for public interest, scientific or research purposes. But in those cases, you would then have to demonstrate that you are actually allowing people to access that data for those purposes. It's not enough to say that we're doing that and then to sort of hold the data forever. Um, it's a little bit of a change in thinking for a lot of organizations where we like to hold on to stuff forever because we see it as an asset. We need to see that some of the inf information going forward, the personal stuff after a set period of time, it's actually a risk to our organizations. Um, the next two items are, are um, um, going to be a particular interest to our uh, my colleagues here uh, at Experience. And what it really says is, well, really, you need to make sure the data is secure. Um, and against unauthorized access, uh, loss, destruction, or damage. Um, so that, that's really important. I think that is one of the principles. Uh, and also the next one that says, uh, as part of our Article 5, it's a requirement that the controller which is going to be most of you in your organizations in some form or another for some function, you are going to be responsible for and able to demonstrate compliance with the principles. It's this idea of demonstrable compliance. Um, if you were to be reported to the ICO or the, the, uh, the DPC in Ireland um, and they were to come out, you, you should be able to prove how you are meeting um, these principles and there's a minimum document, documentation that's sort of required around this. Okay, so the idea of person, personal data. Um, the legislation has been brought up to date to effectively take, take an account that you can get different bits of information from different places and put them together to come up effectively with a profile on a person. So I'll not read out the text there, but um, when, when you, you can look at the slides sort of offline after. So, but if you look at this, this is a really, really broad definition of what constitutes personal data. And it includes things such as ID numbers, location data. So it could be logons, emails, um, it could be goods within a system. It, it's really, really a broad definition of what constitutes personal data. So when we've been advising clients and they've been asking about does this constitute or not, I, I've been erring on the side of caution and saying, well, if we're not sure, let's treat it like it is some sort of personal data and, and make sure that we have the ac um, adequate protection and controls um, around it. So. Personal data is really, really a very broad, very, very broad topic. Now they talk about this other concept of sensitive um, personal data under the legislation. Uh, and what this really is, is, is the stuff that organizations may hold on individuals that, that, that we as subjects may not want um, to be to be released. This is the stuff that we, we could argue is gonna cause us either actual real physical harm, um, or it could lead to harassment, or it could lead to um, embarrassment, or, or, or mental health issues, and all that sort of stuff. So there's a few things that are quite important in there. It's worth worth making note of. That, so there's some things in there: the sort of racial, ethnic background, sexual orientation, you know, physical and mental health. So that's all the stuff that 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 we would probably associate with that, and things around uh, criminal offences. But if you notice as well, there you get things on somebody's political opinions. Um, their religious beliefs um, or philosophical beliefs, and also whether they're a member of a trade union. Um, so this is, 
stuff that we have to that we have to be very careful about protecting. Um, and if you identify you're, you're you're holding any of these sensitive categories of, of personal data, I, I'd mentioned before about you need a legal basis for holding the information. So there are six standard categories of, of legal information. And in most businesses, you're going to be relying on unless you're working for government, you're relying on consent. Um, entering into a contract with somebody or a legitimate interest of, of your business. So those are the kind of the main ones that come up time and time again for, for, for regular regular businesses. But if you're gathering any of these sensitive information, you need to have that legal basis and then there are additional categories of why you need to hold that. And, and for each one of these, you, you really need to have a record of, of, of why you're holding the, the, this information. Um, it's not the details on the slides, it's something that you can go onto the ICO website and, and, and get more information on. Okay, so this is some of the changes from the uh, the existing Data Protection Act. So we'd already touched on the geographical scope. Um, so this apply, what, what this applies to is really anybody who's an EU citizen, and it, it, and it applies on whether the processing takes place in the EU or not. So that's very relevant for Brexit, but it's also very relevant um, for all of us that are, that are using cloud services. For example, you know, if you're using something like um, Salesforce or, or maybe you have some Amazon instances or software, you, you might not actually be sure technically where your data is sitting. So in theory, this legislation applies globally and it's there to protect um, our our information. Um, I'd mentioned Facebook earlier on, you know, they have already said this week that they are effectively going to apply this legislation and they're going to use it as their basis for, for their for their protection um, going forward. So it applies to non-EU business that, that hold, hold data of, of uh, EU citizens as well. Okay, so penalties. This this is one of the big ticket items that's kind of been all all over the news. So at the moment, the ICO can um, can already fine an organisation up to half a million pounds, which is quite a significant amount of money. But this legislation has been they've increased the fines so they can go over the likes of the the Facebooks, the Amazon. I keep picking on Amazon when I'm talking about this, and I don't know why because they never cause me any bother. Um, but if you imagine half a million pounds to some of those organisations is almost I'm not going to say it's nothing to them, but it's something that they could easily absorb. So they have uh, changed the legislation where an organization could be fined up to 4% of annual global turnover or um, up to 20 million euro. Uh, and again, this is being written in the UK legislation as part of the data protection bill as well. So it will be converted into, in, in, into pounds. So this, it's a significant amount of, of money and it's quite a quite a big stick to hold over the global um, um, organizations. Now, what the ICO have already said is any fines that they that they issue to uh, UK organisations are going to be a proportionate. So it's going to be proportionate to the size of the organisation and the seriousness of the, of the data breach. They, they're not wanting to put organisations out of business unless they are, are are a business that is blatantly you know unethical or or operating um, illegally. Um, you know some of the you know some of the call centres, for example. You know you go into the IC website, you can see where they have actually shut them down uh, because they have been found not to not to be um, um, adhering to, to the legislation. So the penalties, so the rules actually apply to both data controllers and data processors. So an example might be you have your organization and you outsource your payroll as a classic example to a, a specialist firm that deals with that sort of stuff. So there's responsibilities at both ends of that chain that they have to look after that data. Uh, and, and potentially if there's a failing at either end, there, there could be sanctions in, in, in place for that. And that's why it's really important, important and it's a requirement that you have proper agreements in place with anybody who's acting as a data processor on, on, on your behalf. So the fines are out there, but I don't really think they're anything to worry about um, um, above and beyond you know, what's already in place for the ICO. Okay, so one of the, the new requirements is around breach notification. It says the ICO must be informed within 72 hours. That's 72 hours of when you become aware that there's a potential breach. Uh, and also, if you deem that your data subjects or your customers or clients are at risk, then they must be informed without undue delay. So that's one of those sort of legal terms where it's hard to it's hard to define. But one of the working groups has said that, well, really, that ideally, that should be within uh, within one month. So it's kind of left a bit vague there. 72 hours is there to allow you sufficient time to have a look at the incident, to perform a risk assessment on it. Um, you may go back and forward to the ICO on that. Um, and again, if you go onto their website, they would they, they will detail out what you need to get information that you need to gather for breach notification. So um, it's to give you enough time to say whether is this actually an incident that has to be reported or 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 not. Uh, and then also this without undue delay, it's to give you a, a period of time to, to, to work in because if you if you 
were to declare to your customers that there's been a data breach and it turns out that there haven't, then you're really at risk of kind of reputational damage at that point. Um, where they, you know, they might think that you're you're bothering them and, and all that sort of stuff. But then on the on the on the minus side, if you don't inform them sufficiently quickly, then it might look like you're actually trying to trying to hide the fact as well. So it, it, it's kind of left a little bit woolly for you to do a proper risk assessment on it and uh, uh, to decide one is it a proper incident and then to decide on, on the best course of action to to actually contact your 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 customers. Okay, so there are there are a number of risks around failures with, with data protection controls. Um, so what we're really talking about is around if you have an accidental or, or breach of your personal information. Um, so um, okay, so so some of the things that that, that that would classify as a breach. One is unauthorized access to personal information. Um, there have been a number of cases recently where people have looked at. Um, people working for police services, for example, looking at records of former partners or former partners, new partners. Um, people have been caught and fined for that. Um, same with medical records. Um, obviously, we've, then you move on, you've got the uh, the theft of, of data containing personal information. So that's kind of your, that leads on to one of the other things, which is kind of either somebody in your organization actually stealing data, um, or it could be hacking cybercrime. That would maybe fall under that as well. Um, the accidental loss of data containing personal information. So that's the classic example, the government minister leaving a laptop or a bag in a taxi. So depending on, on the, uh, the data that, that's held there, the ICO actually take a pretty dim view on that kind of thing. And again, you can go onto their website and look at the kind of things that they, they hand out um, fines for. Um, so that's the accidental loss. Uh, and the next one is the accidental transmission of personal data. This is, this is a classic one. Um, this is sending an email to the wrong person. Uh, and we've all done it. Um, and I did it not that long ago, but luckily it wasn't, there was nothing, you know, you do the autocomplete and the person goes back and go, yeah, okay, you've sent this to the wrong person. Again, there are there are instances where the ICO have fined organizations or individuals a lot of money. Um, there is an example of a solicitor sending case files. So it didn't release what obviously what was in the case files, but obviously it, it could be anything. And it's likely to be a lot of that sort of sensitive information that we talked about. Um, they repeatedly sent it to the wrong recipients, and they got hit with a, a major fine for that. In my head, I have I, I, I remember the figure seventy five thousand pounds, but it might actually be more than that. Um, so the next one, obviously, is hacking and cybercrime, um, where you need to where you are at risk, uh, and, and really in in terms of that, you need to make sure that you're well on top of your your information security controls around that, and that's where. Um, um, my colleagues here will probably um, expand on that a little bit later on in the, in, in the webinar. And then the next one is really subject access requests. Um, as data subjects, we have the right to request to know what an organization holds on us. Um, within most commercial organizations, you probably find you're not getting an awful lot of these requests. Where you're likely to get these is likely to be um, it's some sort of HR dispute where you're likely to be asked about, you know, what records do you hold on me and emails that have gone backwards and forwards and all that sort of stuff. So that is a bit of a risk area. Um, what we're finding is uh, unless you are a, a, a public body, uh, like a government body who are probably already getting these, you're, you're not likely to see much more of an increase in this. We, we, we don't think, don't, don't hold me to that, but they are finding they are getting a lot of these subject access requests. So, so in theory, this is a risk because if you were to, something were to happen uh, and maybe you had to report an incident and it became sort of media knowledge or whatever, potentially you could be swamped with these subject access requests and you have a legal obligation to report, to send the, the information back to the, the, the data subject within uh, a month. Or, or 30 days, unless you can demonstrate that it's completely unwarranted or it's um, or it's really as a burden on the organization, in which case you, you can ask for extra time to do that. But potentially that could take up a lot of time and resource to, to deal with that. Okay, so what can you do to be ready? I mean, effectively what this is about is minimizing your, your risk. Um, so you need to take appropriate steps to protect the data. So you need to have good system access controls. That addresses the risk of unauthorized access to systems where you only give authorized people access to some of your sensitive information. Um, in terms of your uh, um, reducing your, your um, exposure to, to sort of hacking attacks and malware, um, make sure that your, your system patching is, is, is up to date. Make sure you've got a good robust um, um, process in place for that. Um, and also that you're looking at around things around, around vulnerability management. Um, if you're if you have staff out running around with with mobile devices, make sure you've got appropriate mobile device protection in place. You know, at, at the very minimum, make sure they have a PIN or a password enabled. And there's other technical controls that you can put around in place in, in this. Uh, next one is password management. Um, 
you can have really good technical controls around that, but if you don't have the policies and processes in place to back that up, then you're leaving yourself at risk. So people need to be informed that they need to have good passwords. There's websites that you can go on to where you can look at the top 100 or worst 1,000 worst passwords in the world. If your password is on that list, you might as well not have a password. It, it can be cracked with, um, you know, trivially, effectively. Um, and also things in your environment, you know, making sure people aren't using shared passwords, that they're not shouting about, oh, you know, such and such is off today, I need access to, oh yeah, their account is and their password is. If that kind of knowledge is, is kind of kicking around in your environment, then you want to have a look at some of your, your policies and processes around that. And that feeds into the next thing about making sure that your staff are appropriately trained and you have defined policies they can refer to um, as part of the for example the ISO standard around information security the 27001 there is a requirement in there of to have defined policies but also to make sure that your staff are trained so some places do like a, an annual training I would suggest you know even a monthly email reminder coming out from somebody saying make sure you've got good passwords or you know make sure you take care of your laptop and all that sort of stuff I think I think that, that that's a really really good step to, to, to implement uh, and then the next one is really just make sure that you're you're kind of checking and, and, and implementing whatever the current best security best practices are an example might be if you have two-factor authentication available to you you might want to think about enabling that in your for for whatever services um, if you're not sure about any of these things there, there there's organizations out there that are being more than happy to help you um, so even within your own organization speak to whoever's responsible for compliance or your technical person or reach out to, to organizations like, like Experience or whoever any of your other vendors are uh, and actually ask for their advice and, and help on, the, on those topics. Mark, thank you very much indeed for that very insightful overview of GDPR and uh, the minefield that we're all going to have to try and negotiate over the next wee while. Um, we, we thought we'd throw this up as a is GDPR an opportunity or threat um, and I, I really wanted you to get uh, me to give you experiences perspective of what we're finding we're finding that some organizations are actually using this as an opportunity they're seeing this as almost a kite mark a, a quality uh, a quality mark that they can then use to reassure their existing clients that they're data is key, their data is central, management of the data is, is paramount to the organization, but it's also to go after new business. Um, and we're seeing organizations that are really adopting a suite of, of, of tools that help them on their GDPR journey. In terms of threat, I mean, we do have the, 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 the threat of fines, but what we're also seeing is our customers being sent questionnaires from their suppliers or being asked by their insurance company, what are you doing in regards to GDPR? So absolutely, it's a threat if you don't do anything about it. Uh, you, there's your reputation, there's your brand. However, we've also had uh, some legal clients say to us that they think that this could be the next PPI, that in a year, two years time, people will then be saying, I believe my data has been compromised or I believe my data has been used elsewhere. So it can be both. And what we're trying to do is sort of educate our clients to say, look, here's some of the things that you can put in place that helps reduce that threat, but also gives your customers, your suppliers, confidence that you're being compliant. So I'll now on to the next slide. So before we go into some of the things that you can do, we thought it'd be worthwhile sharing some of the typical data silos that organizations have, because a lot of companies tend to think of their data as being purely financial or CRM. However, as Mark just touched on, uh, HR is a key area where a lot of sensitive information is held. Email, now in itself, people use their exchange or their Office 365 almost as data silos in itself, their storage. You have payroll, whether it's your, whether you run the payroll or you outsource the payroll. And then what people often forget, we sometimes call them islands of excellence, but these internal databases that people have, uh, where you maybe have users within an organization that have designed something within Excel that are maybe uh, using this information to, to perform their stuff better. So all of these things make up from an IT perspective, uh, data silos, but don't forget the hard copies. 
don't forget the filing cabinets, um, especially from a HR perspective or from a historical perspective, they are key as well. Now, we've just opened up a poll there to try and use, I want to use the email as an example of some of the technologies that are out there that you may or may not be aware. And what we're trying to find out is how many people are currently using the likes of Office 365 over your current on-premise exchange, or if you have other email solutions like Google Mail. So just to put this into context, there's about uh, two thirds of you currently utilize Office 365. Um, uh, the, the rest are either uh, exchange on-prem or have maybe other meal deliveries like uh, Google Mail, etc. So we'll cover some of the, the tools that you can use uh, that will help protect this kind of data silo, among other things. Um, but and it, it'll be important to maybe talk to your provider to see if there's other things that they can provide, Google Mail, etc., to to protect your data. Okay. Mark also then touched briefly on some of today's threats. And I think it's important to say that, you know, threats can be both malicious, i.e. foul play, or they can be accidental. And they can cover a lot of, of areas. So we've known about the likes of data breaches where data has maybe been stolen or account hijacking through the likes of phishing emails where people are offering to put money into your bank account. HMRC would often be a, a typical one. But the ones that we see a lot of would be the likes of the weak access or vulnerable systems. Um, not excluding the likes of a cyber attack that I'm sure everyone's very much aware of, aware of. Some of the stats though that we find very interesting, IBM have just completed a global survey and what they have found from that is that 58% of data breaches are human error. So whilst you can look at your technical solutions, human error is still a major contributor to data breaches. The other interesting stat is from a ransomware perspective, ransomware has increased 6,000% from 2015 to 2016. And certainly we've seen uh, a big increase in the number of instances of people looking to, uh, basically they've had their data kidnapped and what, what can they do? And that again is a serious data breach. So from an IT perspective, what steps could you take to help with GDPR compliance? And I have to stress again, this isn't a catch-all. This is purely some areas where you can look at um, that Mark has touched on, uh, but we'd like to delve into a little bit deeper to help with compliance and getting you on that road to compliance. So we'll talk about password management, system patching and vulnerability management, which the ICO are now saying that if people do not have a proper patching policy, they can see that as being not necessarily fraudulent, but uh, it's not been seen as uh, keeping things, your house in order. Mobile device protection is another key area because, as Mark again touched on it, we're using smartphones, we have people working in the field, we have people working from home. We also have a big increase in what people would call as BYOD, bring your own device. So how can we protect that, the data that might reside on that? And then we'll finish on the staff training and define policies. So password management. Uh, we'd like to cover a couple of, of areas on this. We call it rotational password policies. Um, so if you think of it, when you first get onto a network, you will have a, a system access or system logon. What we're saying to organizations is, look, those logons are fine, but don't repeat the same logon necessary for your access to your CRM or your accounting software or your HR software. Um, put in place rotational policies uh, where, for example, every 48 days or every six day, 60 days, you're asked to change your password. And it shouldn't be Allen 01, Allen 02, Allen 03. You need to look at making it a bit more complex. More importantly, and Mark did touch on this, um, make sure that people aren't sharing passwords within an office to access systems. A typical scenario would be a company with maybe 10, 15 people needing access to the accountancy software, but only five user licenses. So what inevitably happens is people start to share passwords. And that again can constitute a significant data breach. The third point though that we would say is don't bring personal passwords into the workplace. 
we did have a situation recently where a client, uh, a member of staff had his LinkedIn password compromised, but he used the same LinkedIn password for his Office 365 email account. So people were very easily able to then get onto his Office 365 email account and start to interrogate and compromise their email. So rotate your passwords, have a policy in place every 48, 60 days. Make sure you have enough licenses for the user's access in the systems that you have so that they're not sharing passwords and don't have personal passwords in the business field. The second area that we would certainly recommend is look at the likes of two-factor authentication. In basic terms, two-factor authentication is where you have something you, 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 you have to log on to system something you have with something you know. So simplistically, when you go to a bank machine, you have a physical card, but you actually also have your PIN code. So there's organizations like RSA will offer two-factor authentication, which is another level of security. However, if we take the Office 365 uh, application, you can have two-factor authentication today for your mobile devices, so that if you people are using their own personal device, they have to use two-factor authentication to log on to the email on your mobile phone. This all depends on the uh, Office 365 SKU or the, the, the program, licensing program that you're on, but again, that is there today. In terms of system patching and vulnerability map, uh, management, um, could I ask, just as a quick poll, how many of you currently have a proactive way of updating your uh, systems in terms of patch management? And I'm not just talking about Windows patch management, I'm talking about Google Chrome updates, I'm talking about Adobe Acrobat updates. It's all those things because uh, Windows isn't just enough. So um, what, what we have is about 30% of you are saying, yes, we have active patch management. 70% are saying no, or we're not sure. Okay, why is it important? Well, the National uh, Cyber Security Center basically, and I think there's been a lot of, of instances where it's now well publicized, that vulnerabilities and systems are used to breach and get access to data. So by applying security updates every Tuesday, Microsoft have what they call Patch Tuesday, where they release uh, security updates for all their core applications. So it's not just in terms of keeping you, you right, but recent um, research has shown that on average, uh, a business that has had a cyber breach, uh, about 1,380 pounds is the average cost, but typically it can be a minimum of 10,000. And certainly we've had uh, instances where clients have rather paid the ransom um, and, and just got back access back to their data hoping that it hasn't been copied, hoping that it's not gonna find its way out there on the web. But more importantly, what in another recent survey from uh, the cybersecurity department, we found was quite surprising is 45% of small businesses surveyed had been hit. 57% of small businesses have carried out health checks and audits to identify cybersecurity risks. But in our own webinar last month where we covered cybersecurity, 60% weren't sure whether they were protected or whether they had a breach. So patch management um, is a key, key area. We've rolled it out internally here. Um, and it, uh, unashamedly, it's a product that has been one of our fastest adopted products, the patch management as a service. So it is something seriously to consider to keep your systems up to date. Okay, mobile device protection. Again, we kind of, kind of talked about bring your own device, but this is a way, and there are some key tools that are already out there that will allow organizations. So for those of you that have Windows 10, you can enable BitLocker drive encryption. So that's an instant win that means if the laptop is stolen, uh, it's encrypted. We've talked about two-factor authentication, but again, within Windows 10 and within a lot of more up-to-date like Microsoft services, you can have face recognition as well as passwords. So you have a way of automatically building, building that into the technology. 
But where Microsoft are really, really pushing um, is in line with the likes of the Enterprise Mobility and Security or Windows Intune um, suite, uh, which you can use whether you've on-premise Exchange or Google Mail to again be able to, for example, remotely wipe a device if it's been stolen. If a member of staff is leaving and they're using their own personal device, you can silo the corporate data and you can remove that safely. So again, there's products and tools that are already out there. If you uh, need any more information, please contact us or contact your, your, your current provider. Um, mobile device management, for example, within Office 365, that will allow you to have that reassurance that your information is being protected when it's in the field. Okay, moving on to the final area of staff training and defined policies. Obviously, we have this webinar today and the e-learning modules, but one of the other threats is from malicious emails asking you to send money or whatever. So FOSS have a fantastic tool to educate staff from phishing, uh, where it'll send out emails, it'll allow you to see who's actually responded to those emails and allow you to use repetitive education for the, for the staff. But you have also tools out there that allow you to do defined policies. Office 365 has a security and compliance center. And one of the big areas of that is being able to have key defined data loss prevention policies. So if we take a, a scenario where you flag an email as confidential, then that is not allowed to be sent out to a Hotmail account, for example. You can have emails and emails attachments scanned for account codes or payroll information, and they have to be approved before that email is released. So there are tools out there. Uh, that you can avail of, you can upgrade to use, that will actually allow you to put in place uh, controls that will give you a bit more confidence, a bit more reassurance that everything is being looked after. Okay, before we open up to uh, questions, uh, we'd just like to finalize and say, well, what does that mean in summary? First and foremost, don't panic. Um, GDPR kicks off at the end of May, but it's a journey. Um, it's not just a single event. And the whole idea here is for us to be able to really put our hands on heart to say that we can control and manage personal data, data that's in the business and data that is being used outside of the business. Get help. Uh, this is purely an educational uh, webinar. There are organizations like Quadra that can provide consultancy, uh, organizations like ourselves from an IT perspective that can help put the tools in place. And if you aren't sure what to do, please talk to us. Uh, say there's the information uh, commissioner's office as well. So there's a lot of good information on the web, a lot of good organizations out there that will be able to help you on your journey. So the last poll, um, just to get your feedback, because um, we will be in touch obviously, but we'd like to know, it is quite interesting, a, a hectic time in terms of the, the whole GDPR side of things. So if for those of you that were really keen that we, we get in touch with you to discuss your IT security, et cetera, please give, it, give us a shout. Um, the webinar will be published uh, on YouTube, so we and allow you to share the content. And what we're also going to be doing is uploading some white papers uh, covering the 12 steps from the ICO, uh, some of the information from Microsoft and Quadra, so to allow you to download and uh, um, be able to avail of. Okay, uh, that is us finished in terms of the overall presentation. Um, so would appreciate some excessive clapping and cheering, would go down nicely. But what we'd like to do now is open up to questions. Uh, so if you have a question that you'd like asked, uh, what we'll do is I'll read the question out that's been submitted and either myself or Mark or uh, John, who's with us from a technical perspective, will then answer. So. Anyone have any questions they would like to ask?
Okay. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a question in from uh, Marta. Um, so, but if an application sends us a CV for a position advertised on one uh, on a job board, uh, and you want to use it for a couple of different positions, do we need to get consent for each position? Um, part of the issue with GDPR because it, it is a it, it's legis legislation. A lot of the stuff is very much open to um, interpretation, and there could be multiple right answers actually to to a question. So, yeah, that's me kind of putting a caveat around my answer to this. Um, I, I I think. Where you your organisation maybe needs to be, um, I, I don't think you're actually relying on, on consent for this. Um, I, I think in in terms of you could rely on legitimate business and, and perhaps looking to enter into contract because somebody is ultimately looking to get a job with your organisation, so that's them preparing to enter into a contract. So I would use that legal basis, which removes the the, the, the need for consent. Um, but I think about where you might maybe need to check, make a change is, for example, um, on the job board or your website or something where you have your privacy notice. This is where your transparency clause comes in. You you might maybe need to put a statement in there about CVs and job applications where you say that, okay, well, if you apply for job A, for example, um, we will hold your CV on record, for example, for another six months or a year or whatever you choose to be, as long as you're clear about it in case another position comes up. Um, I, just so that that, that that is absolutely clear. Um, and then obviously um, what you need to include there is some sort of contact mechanism for the person to get in touch with you to say, well, no, I don't want you to hold on to this. Uh, and then if they reply and say, okay, don't want you to hold on to this, you then um, make sure that you have a, you remove that from, from your system. So I think it's, um, I don't think you're relying on consent there, but I think your privacy notice needs to be updated to, to uh, take account of, of, uh, of that scenario. Um, if you go onto the ICO website, they've got some very specific guidelines on, on what they would expect to see in a, in a privacy notice. And again, it's just you be about being entirely um, um, open and transparent about, about what you're doing with, with the data. So I, I, I hope that answers your question on that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm just we're, we're just sort of kind of firing down through the questions here. Um, is there an ICO standard that will state that you are GD com GDPR compliant? Um, I'm going to say no. Th th there is something written into the legislation about um, about certification and, and all that sort of stuff. But to be honest, there's nowhere is really at that point yet. I mean, there there are you can get qualifications and being a GDPR practitioner and all that sort of stuff, but they're really offered by, by private organizations. Uh, this is where you know, we have this thing that's written into, into law. Um, there are, you maybe hear about some of the article, about the, some of the working party groups and some of the guidance around that. So a lot of it is really, really open to, to interpretation. Uh, and what some of the legal people have suggested as well is, is we, we will not really know what the ramifications of some of the clauses in there are until it, it actually gets, um, it actually runs through court. Because um, obviously, part of the legal thing, you have you have the the sort of the, the statutes on the book, but then you have precedent and, and case law to back that up as well. Um, so, is, is there a standard? Not really. I'm mean, like the ICO would say we, we've issued the guidance. The legislation is there. It gets maybe kind of up to you to 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 kind of uh, interpret that. Um, this goes back to what I was saying earlier on about demonstrable compliance and where there might be multiple right answers. Um, I think if you have an issue. Uh, and you think your way through it and document what you've done. That's going to look a lot better than than, than if you've ignored it. Um, if we're, you know, and if you're really not sure, you can contact the ICO. Uh, in terms of being a government organisation, they're really responsive about coming back back to people with answers. But then you got to balance that out. Are you uh, are you kind of putting your um, um, your head above the parapet a little bit? So um, yeah. So I hope um, yeah that was Denise Osborne. So I hope hope that answered your question on on that. Uh, the next one is from Gail Burton. Do we need disclaimers on our website specifically for GDPR? Um, if you're using your website to gather information, for example, if you have a contact form, then 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 yes, it's not so much a disclaimer as you do need a link to a privacy statement, uh, uh, and that needs to feed back to your privacy policy as well. And that sort of goes back to what I was saying to one of the previous questions about there's ICO guidance about what um, what goes into your 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 privacy statement, and it's all stuff about what you're gathering, why you're gathering it, the legal basis, how long you're going to hold on to it, and all that sort of stuff. So, so the short answer is, is yes, you need something on your website to do to do to do with privacy. Mm 
Okay, just scrolling it down. Um, okay, this is from Simon Harland. What is your view about collecting and using data for marketing purposes, specifically about time frame or retention? Um, okay, uh, sorry, this this was kind of asked to Andy, but uh, they, they put it down as, as maybe one for for, for me to answer. Um, the the answer about marketing is is really it depends. Marketing is actually already covered by another piece of legislation. It's the PECR which I can't remember what that stands for off the top of my head actually, but it's PECR uh, and the legislation again is available on the ICO website. So GDPR is kind of, kind of, kind of going to fit into this, but it, it sets the rules about what you can and cannot do with, with um, collecting and using data for, for marketing purposes. Where GDPR is going to feed into this is this idea again of transparency. So, you know, if if you have a valid reason why you want to hold on to somebody's details for 10 years or 100 years, as long as that's in your your privacy statement and and you can back that up with some sort of sort of some sort of thinking, you're probably okay. I think the key thing with marketing purposes is at, at every communication going forward, somebody they have to be given a clear opt out. Uh, and if somebody chooses to opt out, um, you need to make sure um, that you remove them um, from your system. Now you are at that point allowed to keep a list of contact details for people who have opted out. I know that sounds counterintuitive. Um, but again, you would apply the principle of minimization on that, where you would say, okay, well, you know, what do we need here? Okay, we don't want to contact this number or this email address and this individual. They've specifically opted out, and that's okay for you to hold on to that information. Um, again, you would need to be clear about how long you're going to hold on to that to make sure that things drop out um, on on the end. So, I advise you to go and, and, and read up on the on the on the PE, uh, PECR um, regulations around that, and it really does depend on what what kind of marketing you're doing. If you're marketing to individuals, um, you do need, need to be aware of um, um, having consent, proper consent captured at the time for that. Um, business to business is actually, a lot, is actually a lot more flexible, but there, you know, there are some concerns about, you know, for example, you know, my email address is mark.hopkins at Quadra, so that's my full name is effectively there. Um, but I think organizations just need to be really careful about how they're protecting, protecting that data. There's none of the regulations that are designed to put legitimate business out, out, out of action effectively. Mark, I'm just uh, uh, I'm just conscious of time here. So we have another uh, one that I thought would actually apply to everyone in terms of backups and data that you've maybe hived off uh, from your live system. Um, so how, how is is there a policy or retention policy that we need to be aware of? Uh, again, that that's an interesting one. Um, I've had uh, people talking on on a number of different scenarios around that. Um, if somebody has asked to be removed, um, and again, this is really where you're relying on consent. Um, this idea of being able to, you know, the the right to be forgotten, r really applies where you're using consent um, as your as your legal basis. Um, do you have to go back through your backups? Again, you have to make a case about how convenient and easy it is to do that. Um, so if you're, you know, if you do effectively have a, you know, like a, a hot backup, for example, um, or, or you're using replicas, for example, obviously if you remove someone from the current system, it will then go to the replica and then it will then feed through to your backups in time. Do you need to go back through your offsite backups? Probably not. Um, your risk there is really is if you have to do a restore going back to those offsite backups, you probably need to have some sort of process in place to make sure that that um, that, that information is then, is then purged to the system. Um, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd be happy for somebody to come up with some sort of clever solution to do it, but for me, um, it depends on what legal basis that you're you're, you're using around uh, around holding that information. Um, I would suggest if you're using contract or, or legitimate interest, you probably don't have to worry about it so much. Um, remove it from the live system and let it and let it kind of filter through. Um, if you are relying on consent, then again, you maybe need to maintain some sort of list of, of, of records that need to be purged. If it's a database record, you might not need to hold personal information on it. You could be going by, um, you know, a good or a, a key field on, on a database table and, and maybe doing it that way and having some sort of purge operation. So, um, not sure if I answered that, but. <laughs> uh, right, well, Mark, I'll give you a wee break here. We've just had a question there on patch management um, and in terms of does that guarantee that uh, your, your systems are 100% secure? Unfortunately not. I mean, patch management, uh, If for having proactive patch management, what it is really doing is com significantly reducing any potential exposure. The first thing the, the software will do is actually look at how out-of-date systems are. 
because typically what we have found is people when they install a new network or put on new software it's updated and patched at that moment in time but unless they have a proactive uh, methodology or process of keeping their systems up to date it will go out of date and there was a, a recent scenario there with C Cleaner when C Cleaner had a breach and uh, I know we were able to remove C Cleaner from our systems remotely until the new version that breach had been fixed so it's not just making sure that you're patching your window systems security breaches happen through third-party applications too so it's a you know patch management is certainly a big big step in making your systems robust but it is something that you've got to constantly strive to do uh mark i probably have time for one last question um so um uh we have one here. Do we need to get privacy notices signed by all of our current applicants on our database? And I'd broaden that to all the people that we currently deal with in business or on our CRM systems. Do we need to go back out to them now and say, "Can't you know? Is it okay to deal with you?" Sorry, I was talking away there and I was on mute. Um, yeah, so we were talking about, about regathering consent effectively for, for records on, on a CRM system. Um, um, so it, it, it kind of really depends. The ICO have said that if um, you can demonstrate that you have gathered consent in, in a manner that um, meets the requirements of GDPR, you don't have to go back to people. Um, so I guess it depends on how you have gathered records. Um, again, I would suggest that how you would protect yourself in, is you go back and see if you can demonstrate that you have consent. Um, if you don't, you're probably going to have to go back and regather that. Uh, and again, always make sure people have the opt out. That 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 is that is quite important. That's how you that's how you protect yourself effectively. Um, if it's business to business communication, again, that's that it's the, the rules are a little bit more flexible around that. So if it's you know it's if it's your existing customers that are on the system, um, then you your legal basis for that is is you have entered into a contract for them where they are effectively probably paying you and you're, and you're delivering services so you probably don't need to go out and gather consent for that but again with all these communications if people want to change or update the details just just make sure that you're you're quite proactive about keeping them on top of that okay mark thank you very much indeed for your time today uh folks that is us our, our time is now up uh thank you all for your participation and the questions i think uh just to just to reiterate we will be making the slides available uh uh, on our website and we will also be adding some um, white papers there as well for you to be able to download and, and catch get some more information on look I think hopefully today has been a bit of a thought-provoking session um, feel free to speak to us reach out to us if you have other queries um, but you know uh, contact your account manager if you're worried about technology solutions uh, and look Best of luck, everyone, in your GDPR journey and making sure that your data is protected. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.